Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast. How do you provide engaging learning experiences that drive true behavioral change? Sponsored by Hemsley Fraser Group. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them there. I'll post a link to the slides and the exit survey in the chat area once the presentation has started. A new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please be sure to complete it as soon as the webcast is ended. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Ian Klein and Ben Clark. Thanks very much, Hester. Um, so today, as you can see from the title slide, we're gonna be talking about providing engaging learning experiences um, in the pursuit of behavioral change. So, uh, quick round of introductions. Um, my name is Ben Clark. Uh, I'm the head of Hemsley Fraser in the US. I've been with Hemsley Fraser for about 16 years now, and I think I've worked in just about every department uh, and every geographical location. And I really think that's helped me understand from many different perspectives what really makes uh, a sort of differentiated learning experience um, and how we make our, our learning events truly transformative. Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining. My name is Ian Klein. I'm a relatively recent addition to Hemsley Fraser as VP Solution Architect. I only joined the company about two months ago, but for several years before that, I was a Hemsley Fraser client. Like many of you probably on the call, I've run learning functions at global organizations, and I can tell you that all the joys that you've had in your career putting together really fantastic learning programs, I've had those same experiences and all the pain points that you've had working with partners, dealing with business leaders who may have different ideas of training priorities than you, budgeting, et cetera. Well, I've experienced those pain points too. And I hope you'll learn a lot from our story today. Thanks, Ian. Um, so just before we begin the, the discussion proper, um, we'll do a, a very brief introduction to, to Hensley Fraser and what we're all about. Um, so, in essence, we are a turnkey learning and development solution provider. And that means that we design, build, deliver, and sustain learning on a global scale. And we usually do that through a combination of various modalities, such as live classroom, virtual classroom, but also um, asynchronous, just-in-time digital content as well. Um, and the way that we try and differentiate ourselves um, as, a, as a transformative learning provider is with those three speech bubbles you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, we've got a, a real passion across the business for learning, but particularly learning innovation. So we spend a lot of time talking and thinking about, you know, what's next? How do we, how do we take learning experiences to the next level? Um, and then we also hope that we're really fun to work with um, and, and, and really uh, a flexible uh, provider. Um, and we can move very quickly as well. Um, so some of the traditional barriers to entry to a, a program, we hope that we uh, do away with. Um, and thirdly, and, and, and probably most importantly, is, is our core of learning content, um, which hopefully you'll get a, a flavor of as we move through our discussion. Um, but it's uh, very carefully designed, has a high design touch, um, and is expertly curated to make sure that it's uh, exactly uh, uh, as needed. So. so today is November 7th, 2019, and I'm sure all the learning and development leaders on this call will agree with me that it's a very, very challenging time. Over several years, we've seen that our teams are being asked to do much more with fewer resources, whether that's tightening budgets or a lower amount of, of headcount, we're being asked to make miracles happen and move mountains with just, just the barest amount of resources possible. And we've been able to do that. The problem is, at least one of the problems, is that so many of our business leaders, the department heads and the executives that we work with, despite their best intentions, despite how smart they all are too, really don't understand what it takes to put together produce, and sustain a really great, effective learning program. Another challenge we have is that seemingly overnight, over the past just a couple of years, everything's gone digital. I can think even five, ten years back, while some cutting-edge companies were focusing on digital learning solutions, 
most organizations, including my own to be honest, really thought of training as nothing more than a live classroom with a PowerPoint deck behind the wall and large training resource guides dropped at every desk. But now today, not only in the learning world and the business world, but all of us, we all learn in a variety of different ways thanks to technology. We can do a quick Google search. We can go to an online content provider. We use micro learning on our mobile devices. And we as a learning department, we've all had to react to that very quickly. Finally, if you think about the media saturated world we're in, it is incredibly difficult to capture anyone's attention for even a fraction of a second. We're getting hundreds of emails every single day. We're getting continually notified by our mobile devices. We're seeing banners flash across TV screens and all of our different content providers. How can we as learning providers in the middle of people's work days that are incredibly busy, how can we get them to stop and pay attention to the learning that we're trying to offer them? It's incredibly challenging. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned the, the, the sort of change that's, that's happened in the learning uh, industry over the last few years. And I actually think that that pace of change is hastening. Um, and, and, you know, that has its innate challenges, but it also has another challenge, which is when you're thinking about a particular solution, especially a digital solution like a learning platform, it makes investment and it makes making a decision that much harder um, because it seemingly will have a much shorter shelf life because of that rate of change. I think you're right, Ben. I think a lot of times we hesitate in making the decision because if we choose the wrong platform, we might be caught with that decision for quite a few years. How quickly are things changing? So what we'd like to do over the next hour or so is, is, is talk through a story. And, and I'm hoping a lot of people on this call remember the 1998 with Paltrow movie, Sliding Doors. If you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic movie. And it goes through two parallel stories. In one, Gwyneth Paltrow makes her subway train in London or tube train in London. And in the other, she misses it because she was just a tiny bit late. And because of that single moment in time, her entire life changes. Now, I'm not sure if I believe that a single moment in time can change your life like it does in the movie, but as L&D heads, there are many moments in which there are little decisions we can make, little actions that we can take that will add up over time and make a tremendous difference in how our learners approach, get excited about our training programs, and make a tremendous difference in the value that our learners take from those programs. Decisions and actions that help us avoid the pit, pitfalls and traps we've all fallen into, myself included, in the past. Now, the good news is these, these different decisions that I'm suggesting we make, these different actions, they don't require us having a team of hundreds or a budget of millions and millions of dollars. Each of these things that Ben and I are about to talk through, we can each do ourselves right now. So what we're going to do together is walk through a typical journey from the discovery of a need for training all the way through a training program being executed and evaluated. And we're gonna look at this journey through two different lenses, through the eyes of two different training managers. In one view, we're gonna look at the story of Jamie, a training manager who experiences all of those pitfalls I mentioned before. Executive pressure, daily stress, time pressure, and not having the right type of tool. And we're going to see how that really, really puts barriers in front of Jamie's learners. Then we're also at the same time going to do that sliding doors thing and take a look at a different training manager, Robin. Now, Robin is going to experience the same things that Jamie does. But in Robin's case, well, Robin's going to do something different at every turning point. And the result of all of that is, well, you'll see. I, I don't want to spoil the sto story before we get started. Ben, take it away. All right. Thanks, Ian. <clears throat> so, um, we're, we're going to set the scene with the, the ideation of a project or the project initiation. Um, and I'm sure we've all been there before, right? A department head kind of unilaterally decides that some training is needed. So, they approach our heroic Jamie and they say, hey, uh, we need some training on a particular topic. Right? And Jamie's been there before. He says, oh, you know, sure thing. Um, but, but without really understanding the need for the training or why it's come about or what the success markers might be. 
Ben, I, I think you're right. And, and I'm sure I'm not the only person on this call that's had that experience where someone just marches into our office or up to our desk and says, I've got a problem. The answer is training. Now get it done in just two weeks. It's not that hard, is it? And, and I can't tell you how often that I've just sat there dejected because I have no idea what I need to do to make that learning effective to make those changes happen. So that was Jamie's experience. Now let's imagine Robin, same thing happens. The department head marches into Robin's office and says, we need training on X. But what Robin's going to do is a little bit different. Robin, very respectively, very respectfully rather, is gonna say, why? Why do we need training? And Robin's gonna ask a few questions that we may not typically ask. And, and that's kind of risky, right? I mean, it might feel like a risk at first. It, it can feel like a risk at first, but Robin's not coming from a bad place. Robin isn't trying to go against this business leader. Robin's really trying to be a consultative partner with the, with the business leader. So Robin's gonna ask, tell me what the problem is that you're facing. What do you see that's not going well in your department? Robin's going to ask, what are the behavioral changes that you wanna see as a result of this training? And what Robin's gonna to try to get that business leader to understand is, sure, the problem could be training, but maybe the problem is something with their tools and their systems. Maybe it's an organizational design problem, or maybe it's just an external problem that no amount of training can provide. But before simply agreeing to throwing tens, hundreds, even millions of dollars into a training solution, let's first talk about what is that need and can training really help? And in this case, Robin has a really good, good discussion with the business leader and they do decide that, yeah, training actually is the right answer. Yeah, and, and throughout this, this discussion, we wanna make sure that our message is resonating with, um, with you as the audience. So we scattered in some polling questions and we'd be really grateful if you take part and actually answer some of these polling questions with us. So I'm gonna flash that up on the screen right now. Um, the question is, has, uh, just like the scenario we played out, has a business leader approached you and simply said, offer training without really a clear idea of the actual need? Um, so um, Hester, we'd be grateful if you'd flash the poll up um, and we'll just give a, just a few seconds um, for our participants to answer and then we'll have a look at the results. That'll be great. I'll be really surprised if, if a lot of people haven't had that same experience, but let's see what our listeners are saying. I can tell you at least five, six, seven times it's happened to me. And, and I always want to add more value than I'm actually given the chance to. And it, and, and it happens, we, we see it as learning providers because you know people will come to us and they already know that they want to run some training, but maybe they haven't asked the, the seminal questions up front. Okay, <coughs> so um, Hester, would, we, would you kindly show us the results? Wow, yeah. look at that. Yeah. Good. 57, almost 60% of people have had that basically order given. And of course, I know we don't want to be ordered, order takers as a learning and development department. We want to be a strategic partner. Again, the way to start moving away from that is respectfully, positively, start asking those questions of your business leaders. Get them involved beyond that top level, I need training, but get them to really think about what they want to see, what they want to hear, and more importantly, what is the result they're looking for? What do they want to see differently as a result of this training. Thank you so much, Hester. Let's move on. Let's move on, all right. So then the next part of that journey um, is the, the selection of, of the solution itself. So Jamie uh, remembers that they used a trainer maybe three, four, five years ago. Um, and Jamie gives that trainer a call. Um, it's a sort of one man band training shop. Um, and they speak to the trainer and the trainer says, hey, Jamie, I remember you. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, yeah, we still have that three day workshop that we ran a few years back. We, we, we can come in and run that again. No problem. Robin has a slightly different experience. Robin does speak to a, a firm they've used before, a training company they've used before. But the difference here is that Robin's chosen more of a consultative partner. And Robin's trainers actually pushing back when Robin says, we'd like a, a live training course, the training organization, their consultant is actually saying, why does it need to be live? And they're pushing back against some old assumptions. Maybe in the past they had a three day live training program, but times have changed. Would it be better to have a more of a blended learning solution where there are videos and PDF downloads and virtual classrooms? What 
type of blended training experience will really meet the need. So not only is Robin pushed against the business leader, but the learning organization that Robin works with is not resting on the laurels. They're also making sure that the solution actually meets Robin's needs at the current time. And they decide that in the end, a live workshop, a shorter one than normal, but a live workshop really is going to be the best option if we have pre-work and follow-up done virtually and digitally. Right. So we move on and, and, and we're, we, we've decided on the, the sort of training program we're looking for. Um, poor old Jamie, though, um, they contract with the trainer, uh, they select the training date um, and they pop it into the LMS. Um, the LMS triggers a standard invite email um, and that invite email goes out to a, a pre-specified target audience and it's a bit dry, kind of a, maybe a plain text email perhaps. Um, very easily missed and, and in our story actually lots of folks do miss that system generated email um, because it's just one of thousands in their, in their inbox and they've got lots of things to be doing. Now Robin's taking a different approach. That business leader who originally came up to Robin and described that really clear need for learning, well, Robin goes back to that business leader and says, hey, look, your people don't want to hear from me in learning and development. Your people want to hear from you, their boss. So Robin gets the business leader to record a very casual, short video, just using an iPhone. And Robin attaches that video of the business leader describing how important this problem is, how important that training is attaches that video to an email that's got a bunch of information and a bunch of graphics that really captures the attention of the learners. Robin has the business leader send out that email and immediately, because it's not coming from L&D, because it's coming from their boss, they know that there's something important in it for them. They hear the passion in the business leader's voice. They understand why that training is so important and they immediately sign up. They see the, what we call the WIFM, the what's in it for me. All of a sudden, right away, they're seeing signups where poor Jamie is really not seeing so many just yet. And, and we're really only talking about, <clears throat> what, maybe 10 minutes of that, of that leader's time. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a quick process, right, if it's done properly. I, I've seen it done. In fact, in our own company, we've seen a video like that from our, our CEO sitting on the steps of his house. Uh, I've also seen another one with... Uh, a CEO or a business leader on the roof of an office building playing with giant connect Four. it doesn't have to be elaborate right. it's just authentic it's transparent it's casual and, and it's real it's, well, exactly and that and it's actually much more effective when it's done you know quickly just, and simply that in that way but I think the difference here is what what Ben and I are saying is don't rely on, on an old style or, or even a, a modern LMS don't rely on an old style text message People like colors and sounds, and they, they want visuals and creativity. Yeah. That's what's going to drive it. All right. So um, we'd like to hear from you again, if we may. So Hester, would you kindly pull up the, the next poll? Um, and the question is, do you have a system that allows you to read it, readily create um, uh, something like we've just described, something creative, um, something fun and engaging? <coughs> Excuse me. So let's see what comes back. I, I can tell you that I, I didn't in my former life have a system like that, but we took great care both within the company and, and partnering with Hemsley Fraser to make sure that that information was written with a real consumer point of view in mind. We thought of it not as a training instructional sheet, but really as an advertisement to get people to care and to make joining instructions incredibly clear. All right, so Hester, could we see the results please? So a lot of people really don't have a system and, and I'm surprised. I thought I was the only person out there that was relying on Microsoft Outlook. It looks like at least 60% of the people on this call also don't have a tool that really, really readily enables modern creative graphic communication. Interesting find there. Thank you very much, Esther. All right, so now we, we've, we've scheduled our workshop um, and we're just about two weeks before. Um, but poor old Jamie realizes that very few people are signing up for the class. Um, and they realize that there's no good way other than to send manual reminder emails or kind of dry LMS prompts to change that, to, to, to encourage people to take notice and sign up. Now, Robin's taking a completely different approach because Robin knows that a big part of getting actual attendees in those training seats 
is keeping them really, really engaged, not only when Robin is inviting everybody, but throughout the entire run up to the live class. So not only is the L&D team still going back to the business leader and asking that business leader to shoot out quick reminders, but perhaps the L&D team is also putting up a few posters around the office. Um, it's old school, but it works. There might be a desk drop with the website where you can find out more information for the class. What we're also gonna be making sure, what Robin's gonna do is giving people snippets of digital content that relate to what's gonna happen in the class so people not only get a taste of what they're gonna learn, but they also get excited to see that this is not gonna be the old style class they were expecting. This is beautifully designed, short, bite-sized content that makes them think and makes them feel that live training experience is going to be a great one. All right, so as we continue our story, we're now just two weeks out. We're, we're in the final kind of countdown to the, to the start of the program. Uh, and, you know, Jamie's nervous because still not many people have signed up. Um, and in fact, actually, some others have dropped out because, you know, it's, there's, there's been very little promotion. They've heard very little about the program. And, you know, frankly, they found better things to be doing. Um, and some other folks are actually now calling Jamie to say, you know what, I don't, I don't have enough detail. I don't even know where this event's happening. Um, and uh, also, even those people who have signed up and are ready to attend, they don't know who else is going to be there. So it's not like they can start having conversations with folks to, to, to talk about this upcoming program. Robin's taken that different approach, and Robin's really focusing on keeping that learning group engaged. So several things happen. First of all, all the learners are invited to a virtual session, just a quick 20 minute virtual session about a week or two before the class where they can actually meet and interact with the facilitator that, that'll be teaching the live course, but they can also more importantly meet their peers, the cohort that'll be joining them on that learning journey. Uh, Robin also makes sure that all the attendees have access to those pre-work items, which are all digital because we don't want paper flying around anymore. We all wanna access things on our phone, on our desktops and our laptops. And Robin also makes sure that way before the class happens, repeatedly, those learners are getting instructional materials, very simple, beautiful designed instructional materials about where to go, how to find the location, what they can find, and what they can expect when they get there. So, so at this point, you're really building momentum. <laughs> we're, building, we're building a lot of momentum here. We're making sure that people don't have that horrible moment the day of the training where they look at their calendar, which already has eight different uh, eight different meetings on it, and they say, oh shoot, I forgot that training course. You know what? I can't go. I'm too busy. By keeping that training front of mind, what Robin is doing is making sure there's no way people will forget, and they keep that as an integral part of their day. All right, so let's hear from you. Um, we want to know now, you know, in your experience, are people dropping out? Is that lack of momentum? Is that lack of engagement? Um, manifesting in, in folks actually just becoming so disengaged that they're not even showing up or dropping out. Yeah, you know, gosh, I, I can think, Ben, I can think of times where I've spent tens of thousands of dollars for a class and we show up on the day and there's a risk that if 30, 40, 50% of people don't show up, which I've heard has happened in other organizations, we are throwing a large part of our budget away. So how many people have had that? What, what percentage of your training invitees either cancel too soon, too, uh, too late in the process for you to actually give that seat to another person or, or just don't, don't even show up at all? I'd say my rate, if I were able to answer this, I'd say for me, it's usually about zero to 10%, but I have had situations where up to 20% of people have dropped out all of a sudden. Well, and, and you know, organizationally, what we see is that when we schedule um, full programs for people, for, for organizations, we, we have to budget at least 10 or 15% cancellation rate if this isn't done properly. And look exactly what's happened. This is what we're seeing. Everyone on this call, the majority of people, almost the majority, 45% of people are looking at an up to 20% loss. Think about that. If your budget was just $100,000, you're losing one fifth of that to empty seats that could be filled. If we had made it different decisions about how to engage with that audience, much, much earlier on in the process, get them excited and build that motivation. That's a lot of money. That's 20 grand right there um, on, something, on something so simple to fix. Okay, thank you, Hester. All 
All right, so it's the big day. The session has arrived, um, but regrettably for, for Jamie, some folks have actually gone to the wrong location um, because the joining instructions weren't clear. Um, there was a couple of versions of them actually. Um, and then some other folks actually turn up a bit late. Um, and then for those 80% for those who do arrive, um, they open the, the, the door to the training room and they, you know, their heart sinks. It's a small, maybe windowless, perhaps strip lit fluorescent light bulbs um, training room uh, and they realize that they're there for the next three days. Um, there's theater style seating, uh, they're sitting in a chair that's too small <clears throat> and to make matters worse, there's a giant 250 page workbook sitting on their desk waiting for them. Yeah, but imagine a different world, Ben. Imagine the world that Robin lives in where the learning experience is as carefully crafted as the content itself. Imagine that we've already made sure we've sent out those learning instructions to the learners multiple times before. Imagine we, we really piqued their interest, whet their interest by giving them online digital snippets of the content that, that they're going to join. And when they get to the room, it, it honestly looks like a playground. It's bright, it's colorful. There are doodle toys, uh, toys that let people play like uh, koosh balls and all sorts of different things to let people fiddle with their hands. There are pens and there's, there, there's brightness. There's not a giant workbook sitting on the desk. There's just a small notepad. Uh, it looks like it's really gonna be a fun and interactive day. And that's another point too. In Jamie's world, people know that they're gonna be out of the office for three days. In Robin's world, they know they're gonna be out of the office for just one. They sit down at those tables, which are in clusters, not theater style, and they're excited for what's about to happen next. Yeah, it's a, it's a mindset. I mean, if you, if you enter that room and you don't feel good, I mean, we're all human beings. We have to understand that that affects the way that people learn. But in, in Robin's story, people are energized, people are looking forward to what's next. Makes a, makes a huge difference. And so now the session's gonna begin and we'll hear about what happens in, in Jamie's classroom. Yeah, well, you can probably guess what happens in uh, Jamie's <laughs> classroom. Um, first of all, it's kind of death by PowerPoint, uh, the old talk and chalk. So um, rather than uh, focusing on engagement and focusing on sharing, we're covering a load of theory because we haven't done that yet. So people sit down, they take their places, we run through an agenda. It's all very staid, it's all very predictable. Um, and it's not energizing and it's not exciting. Um, and, the, and, and, and the first thing that happens is that the facilitator stands at the front and says, okay, open to page one of your 200 page workbook. That's really set the scene. In Robin's world, we have a much, much different experience. And the day is just filled with engaging discussion and activities and exercises that make full use of the available space. People aren't sitting in the same spot all day long. They're moving around, they're working on whiteboards and flip charts. They're building structures with training tools that really get their brains thinking in a lot of different ways. There's very, very little lecture. The facilitator is there not just to read, not just to lecture, not just to teach, but also to help make sure that everyone is interacting, that not only are the, are the learners learning from the trainer, but the learners are also learning from each other and their own best practices. It's also really, really clear that the facilitator understands the company that they're teaching at. They understand the challenges that, that, the, uh, that the learners have. The, the people in the room the entire day, they're laughing and enjoying themselves. And by taking their own notes, instead of just reading a 200 page guide, they're really cementing the learning. The simple act of writing transfers the knowledge to their brains, keeps it active. People are just incredibly energized. And finally, I'd like to say this, by the end of the day, there's a real sense of community. People are actually choosing buddies or accountability partners, as we like to call them, that they promise they're gonna check on every once in a while. People that can help them take those concepts that they learned in the training and apply them to real life situations, even starting the next day. What were you going to add, Ben? Well, we, 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 I don't suppose glossed over it, but we sped past this idea that people are laughing and having fun. But, but what, what a vital part of a, of a truly transformative learning experience to be in that you know, energized, fun mood. It, it really does make all the difference, but it's so easily overlooked. All right. Um, 
Next, folks, after the session, they're back at work. Uh, sorry, my slide's not advancing there. They're back at work and they're worried they've fallen behind. Um, they've, been, <laughs> they've been away from their desk for, for three days um, and they, they realize that you know, there's chaos to deal with. They haven't been checking their email. They're behind on their day job, so to speak. Um, and, and, and then they start thinking, well, what did I just do for that three days? I mean, what did we even cover on, on, at the end of day one? And, and you know, how am I going to remind myself of that? Have I, have I really got to dig through page 26 of my 200-page binder? It's, it's just not a very compelling situation. Well, then I think more importantly, and, and having been in that situation many times myself, I think I'm going to be saying to myself after three days, how on earth am I going to get all of my week's work done in just the two days left in the week? And, and if I'm part of Jamie's group here, I've lost 60% of my work week for stuff I'm probably never going to remember five days later. Contrast that with the Robin group experience. They're back at their desks in just 24 hours. There were plenty of breaks, of course, like there are in any training room, but they haven't lost the majority of their week. Instead, what the people who are out of their office for just one day feel are energized, engaged, and inspired. They want to apply what they've just learned to their work, and they're already at their desks. And, and part of the reason that is, is because we didn't try to cram everything into three live days. We recognize that that, that time together in a learning environment is, is very, very valuable and expensive, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. So we limited that time. We've given them a lot of other information, but through those digital resources before, and as you'll soon see, after the actual live class. All right, so now the evaluations are back in. Um, Jamie's session, uh, unfortunately, didn't really focus too much about the effectiveness of the learning or even any of the, of the outcomes of the learning. Because as we said before, actually, they were pretty preoccupied. Most of their comments were about the poor lighting, uh, food, the temperature, the uncomfortable chairs. And, and I know that kind of sounds like we're hamming it up a bit, but I've seen hundreds and hundreds of evaluations that focus on those very things if you don't get those right up front. Absolutely. Now, contrast that with the Robbins Group's experience. The evaluations, of course, a few people are going to comment on the food and the lighting temperature. As Ben said, it really is a given. But we're going to see from that group very likely that the session was not only a lot of fun, but it was very valuable because when people are laughing, when people are talking, when people are learning for each other, they get engaged. They find that so much more valuable. And guess what? They remember those experiences for months, even years after the training day. Several learners there in their, in their evaluations write about how this is the first live class they've ever been to that had real business value and that was able to keep their attention going the entire day. So the learning manager, in this case, Robin, gets instant encouragement that this particular training intervention was effective in a way that poor Jamie hasn't. That's right. <clears throat> So what about the following weeks and months? Um, well, uh, in Jamie's case, what we notice is that there's very little behavioral change, very little um, uptick in performance, but we expected that because actually folks were distracted. They didn't get what everybody intended for the, for the training to achieve. It, it, it just didn't happen. Um, so there's no discussion. Um, there's very little kind of continuing learning opportunities. Um, there's very little buddying up between the attendees. Um, and, you know, by the way, that, that giant tome of a workbook, that's collecting dust somewhere, never to be looked at again. Robbins made a choice to use a new type of tool, not an LMS, but a learning experience platform. This is a very simple Netflix-like tool that allows Robin, who does have a very lean team, to simply hit a button, a single button, and again, using a very creative and graphic email format, send out reminders to each of the participants that they've got some post work to do. And that post work isn't onerous, it's not difficult, but they're short, again, short pieces, short assets, short snippets of work that once again reinforce the fact, or, or rather reinforce what they learned during class. Robin knows that a training is not a one and done event. If you wanna make the learning stick, people have got to be reminded and engaged with that content on an ongoing basis. So not only do they get those extra pre-work pieces, but 
Robin also makes sure that the learners know about all of the different resources for them to learn about that topic that are available on that learning experience platform. A couple of months later after the class, again, realizing that if you just think of training as a one day experience and done, you lose all the value, Robin invites everybody to a virtual classroom, not a plain, boring, dull webinar that we know everybody's gonna be multitasking on, but a real modern virtual classroom that allows people to interact, that has not only polls, but drawing and typing tools that even allows people to break out virtually in sessions. This continual reinforcement makes sure that people are reminded of what they learned during live training, and now together with their cohort once again, have the opportunity to practice what they've learned. We might even teach them some new pieces of content as well. The learning manager also continually reminds those people, or sorry, reminds those learners that they have access to these just-in-time resources. Think about, uh, think about hosting a recruitment course, for example. You learn how to be the best interviewer you can be in January, but you don't actually have to hire anyone till September. Are you really gonna remember everything you learned in January eight months later? Probably not. But if you had a place to quickly download and access one-page guides, short resources, how amazing that would be. And that's what Robin has provided through this learning experience platform. One last thing that Robin does is make sure to ask people three months after they've taken the training to once again fill out a very short evaluation form saying, not what have you learned during the class, but what have you applied that you learned during that class a few months ago? What really stuck with you? Robin also asks those learners and managers to do the same thing. So Robin can really keep track of the behavioral changes that are already starting to propagate throughout the workplace. All right, so um, our last poll of the day, I think we'd like to hear from you. Um, if you've got access to something like this, um, do you have a, a learning platform um, that can deliver what we've been talking about, this sort of perhaps month long sort of continuous learning experience? Uh, they, they certainly exist. We, we know that some folks are going to say yes. We're just interested to, to know what sort of ratios we've got here. So let's see that. Yeah. Do you have an easy way to send out digital resources? Do you have an easy way to communicate with that learning group for days, weeks, months after the training is concluded? Do you have a way to check to see if they're actually applying what they've used? Let's see what you think, either yes or no. And Hester, what is the group saying today? I'd be really interested in seeing what people have said. Yeah, a lot of people don't have that, of course. Most of us, and again, myself included in my former life, about the best thing I had, even in a large company, was email. And it, it was very, very difficult, not only to keep, not only to get the information out to my group, but, but to see if they've actually accessed it and used it. Well, and it's impossible to differentiate an email. They just blend in with the, the hundreds and thousands that you've, you've got anyway. Exactly. It doesn't stand out. Okay, thanks very much, Hester. All right, um, so now the, the department head who kicked all of this off wants to know, uh, you know, what's the ROI? What's happened? What's changed? What's been the effect of this learning? Um, and Jamie uh, sort of has to hang their head and say, well, actually, not much. Uh, not much has changed, and I can't really demonstrate anything for the, for the big bucks that we spent on this session. And I'm, be I'm guessing that in that meeting, the business leader is getting a bit frustrated at Jamie, who's now spent several tens of thousands of dollars on the solution. Robin, because of all the different decisions that Robin has made since the very beginning, remember all those different decisions. Robin was, was challenging the actual training need itself and, and making sure it was a training solution that was required. Robin was making sure to work with a partner who both gave, uh, gave them best practices, but who also questioned the need for a three-day workshop. Robin, who also made sure that everyone had access to digital resources, instructions, made that learning day really fun and engaging, and in the months afterward, continued to re-engage that audience. Well, they've got a different experience when that business leader comes back, because what the business leader has done is they've walked around the office. The business leader has seen that behavioral change. They've been hearing people say, you know that training you asked us to go to three months ago? That, that really made a difference. I, I've really taken a few things. 
the business leader has has seen that that different business metrics are, are actually tweaked in a, in a positive way that they weren't before. Even better than that, what Robin's able to do now that, now that they've got that tool is pull up a report showing that, yeah, you know, 95% of everyone who went to that training course has accessed some of these digital resources. And, and about 95% of the people who attended that course, they also got engaged and went to that follow-up follow -up class. So it's, it's been really, really clear that there's been real knowledge intake and behavioral change right away. And, and as I've said before, as we look at the end results of this entire story here, we have all lived the story on the left. Everyone on this call, we have all put our heart and soul into the development and launch of a training program that just doesn't get the traction we were hoping for and that doesn't lead to behavioral change. It's not because we're not good at our jobs. It's not because we're all not smart. It's not because we're not capable of doing it. It's because of the business pressures we constantly face. It's because of changing expectations from our business leaders, from our learners. And it's because we sometimes, well, many times actually, simply don't have tools that are really fit for purpose. But these are all things that can be overcome with your existing team and when you, with your existing budget because Everything you've just seen us do, everything you've seen Robin do to change the experience, that's how we do it at Hemsley Fraser. And everything that we do here at Hemsley Fraser, you can do right now yourselves to make the same difference. So what I'd like to do now is talk you through Hemsley Fraser's approach to how we create engagement and we develop programs that lead to lasting change. And it's all about what we call the three E's, excite, engage, and embed. And you'll see that engage here is listed twice. In fact, we start there. The first thing we always do when it's time to create learning, when, we're, when we have a request come in for giving learning, is we engage with our stakeholders to make sure we understand their challenges and their goals. We wanna make sure that we know what what the current situation is and what's the situation they'd like to see. We get them engaged with the vision of training that is different from what they might have seen in the past. We get them engaged with the idea that you can get a lot of effective learning done without so much time away from the classroom by using virtual classrooms, by using a mix of digital tools. We also want to make sure that our solution meets your needs. It is incredibly easy for any training provider to say, here's our library, make sure that you choose something in there and, and I'm sure it'll work for you. What we try to do is different using our incredible content library, which is very pick and mix. We make sure that we're taking as a start, as a base, we're taking from all the best practices we've seen around the world. And if you have something off the shelf, or if we have something off the shelf that works for you, we'll be happy to include that as part of a solution. But if what you really need is something custom or bespoke, we'll do that as well. The next thing we do once we've worked with you to determine what's the most effective learning solution is we find many, many ways to create buzz around your employees. It's that what's in it for me through videos, through graphic emails, through providing them with early access to content, we're making sure that your learners are engaged with that training experience they're about to have way in advance. So they arrive not only excited, but they also arrive with a knowledge of what they're gonna learn so that they can bring their own experiences to it. They can share their own stories in course. And that's what we do on the day. We don't lecture. We don't show you PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide. We make sure the day is all about interaction and discussion and uh, role plays and exercises that really take those theoretical concepts that put people to sleep and turn them into really action-oriented sessions that people will remember for as long as they're in the workplace. And finally, as Robin did as well, we know that a single training day is not gonna change someone's lives. What does change people's lives and behavior is by making sure that training stays front of mind. So using our learning experience platform, using additional follow on virtual and even live sessions, we make sure that people keep that content front of mind and have plenty of opportunities to apply what they've learned 
to real life business situations. And what we typically see as a result of that is far greater engagement with the training, far greater behavior change than we see with different older learning styles. Yeah, and in addition to the, the, that sort of classroom and sort of physical um, engagement journey and story that Ian's talking about, um, it, it really helps to have um, a platform through which to do that. We've talked a couple of times about whether you, the audience, has a platform that enables um, that sort of very rapid sharing of what's relevant in the business. So it's not just about sharing learning snippets. It's not just all of those great things that Ian was talking about, but it's also how do you communicate with an audience? How do you engage a group of people with what's really, what really matters to the business, what's relevant to them? How do you facilitate that? How do you cut through the, the gray of email and uh, provide some really uh, evocative content? So uh, part of that solution is with a, a proper engagement platform. Um, and so I wanted to show you um, a couple of uh, platforms that we use at Hemsley Fraser, uh, one of which is a, a purely a learning platform. But what we discovered as we deployed our learning platform was that actually um, a, a business focused engagement platform uh, really is the, the true driver of learning engagement. Um, and th these platforms have to be entirely user friendly because as we know, um, people are already engaging with very user friendly digital platforms like Netflix, like Amazon, like Spotify. And the solution that we're using in business has to be something very similar. Um, so I'm going to flick to that right now and show you the two platforms that we're using. Um, so the first of which is a, a, is a learning platform here. And as you can see, um, it's immediately intuitive. Um, I hope you can tell just from looking at this screen for a few seconds how it's going to work. I mean, this looks like I was going on to Netflix or Roku or Spotify, and, and this is the exact interface, the exact type of consumer-driven beautiful interface that, that all of our learners are, are using from the moment they get home till the moment they go back to work. This is how people consume content now. We've applied that same type of beautiful design and interactivity level to learning in, in, in a way that very few people have so far. That's right. Um, and you can see if I want to if I want to know how to build effective teams, I click on that and it immediately opens up a playlist. So playlisting is something that's familiar to us. People understand it's intuitive. There's no there's no barriers to accessing this content. And I can see that not only is it easy to use and intuitive, but actually we're cutting through something else, which is there's a, there's a bit of paralysis of choice out there these days. I mean, you can Google a particular learning topic. You could Google how to build effective teams, but you'll be re you'll get you know 50,000 returns and because it's not curated. Because it's not curated, so it's not easy to know where to start. Um, so we've, <clears throat> as well as the careful curation, we've actually built in an ordering as well to take that sort of burden of choice away from uh, people. Um, now. Uh, we, we've only got a few minutes before we'd like to open this up to a, to a Q&A session. So I want to show you a sort of evolution of this idea, this, this learning platform, which is what we're calling an engagement platform. Um, and this really is the, the culmination of everything we've learned since, since really focusing on this for the last five or six years. Um, and it's an idea that um, in order for, for learning to be transformative, in order for learning to make a difference, it has to be contextualized properly. Um, it has to be relevant and it has to be front of mind for folks. And the way that we do that is we, we blend it, we, we wrap it up in lots of other things that people might find interesting that aren't sort of your traditional learning topics. So you can see a few things right here, life skills, for example. Um, it really matters to people that, you know, they're able to understand a mortgage statement, for example. You've got people new to the workforce. They're very easily distracted by some things that, that other members of that workforce might take for granted. Um, and we, we, we're thinking about things like mindfulness. How do you switch off? How do you detach? Um, and then just things about, you know, what might I be interested in? So just social pursuits, things that bring an organization together, things that get people talking. Um, but also, we, we, as well as just kind of, unusual or, or um, tangential subject matters, we're also thinking about the, the modalities of learning that we're, we're putting out, how we wrap our content up. Um, and so you can see here as well, we've got things like podcasts, 
uh, which people can consume on the go. They can look at those at the, or listen to those at the gym or in the car or whatever. Um, so we hope you found today informative. We hope you found it enjoyable. We've got a few key takeaways before we open up to the, uh, to the Q&A session. So really, how can you provide engaging learning experiences that drive true behavioral change? Go back to that 3E process that we told you. You need to excite people about the learning. You need to engage your stakeholders so that they really buy into a solution and, and play their own role in getting learners excited and holding learners accountable for the learning. You need to engage them during the training by providing them with a fun experience that's not about lecture, that's not about PowerPoint slides, but about real high level of interactivity. And you've got to make sure that you keep that learning embedded. And the way to do that is by using a very consultative approach throughout the entire process. Make sure you're really talking and working with your business leaders to find the right solution. Make sure that you are working with a partner that not only provides you with best practices guidance, but challenges you to do things in a slightly different, maybe more challenging way than you've done it before. And, and if you're able to, as a client myself, I can tell you having the right platform to share digital assets, both pre and post, to keep your learners engaged, really makes an absolutely big difference. What we'd like to do now is just spend, spend the last few minutes of this webinar, we hope you found it informative, We'd like to hear your questions. So what questions do you have? And I've already seen one question here pop up in our queue, which said, will the chats be made available? Absolutely. Hester, at the end of the class, our fantastic host, Hester, will be sharing with everyone how to download the slides. So we'll make those absolutely available to you. What other questions do you think that you have? What would you like to learn about how you can take those and in, and in addition to the slides, we're also very happy to provide, in a, in a, as a thank you for uh, joining us today, um, we'd, like you to, we'd like to provide you with access to both of those learning platforms, or the learning platform and the engagement platform. Um, so we, we will facilitate um, access to that after this webinar, so you can expect to see an invitation for a, um, a free period on both of those platforms. So what would you like to know? We've been talking for a good 50 minutes now. What would you like to know how to make sure that, that your training courses are, are really engaging, that you're able to have the maximum amount of learners show up and, and really take what they've learned during your classes and really apply it? Esther, do we have any questions in the queue? Not at the moment. Okay. All right, I did get one come in. I did get one come in and, and that question is really, uh, here it is, yeah, came in through email. And what the person's asking here is, whose responsibility is it really to get the learner excited about the class? I mean, is it, is it all on us, the, the learning professional, or do the people themselves, the learners themselves, have a role to play? Um, well, I, I mean, it's interesting. I think the, 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 it, it's definitely a shared responsibility, um, but it's sometimes difficult for uh, the learner to know that it's part of their shared responsibility. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, um, it helps if you can facilitate um, the learner being part of that uh, exciting journey. Um, so if you provide the tools, if you provide the, the means for the participants themselves to become engaged and to, to really contribute to this, this idea that there's a, a sort of continuous learning journey that starts weeks before the event itself, then what you'll find is, and what we certainly found, is that learners actually pick them, take that mantle up. Um, they, they are encouraged simply by uh, virtue of, of having a, a platform, having a, a means to uh, get involved with the learning event itself. Um, and they do, they, 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 they relish that idea. Um, and, and it's actually very effective in it. And it's part of what, what makes something transformative. Thanks, Ben. We've got another question here. How can you implement something like this when not everyone in the company uses technology like in a retail environment? Well, there are a couple of different things you can do. And thanks for asking that question. What we've done for clients who don't have a situation where everybody has their own computer is you can actually set up kiosks 
like a retail kiosk that simply could be an iPad or a laptop attached to a table so that you bring people, you give people the opportunity in their break room, in their work room, or even, even on the factory floor to do the learning. Yeah, that's, that's right. And I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be, I mean, we're, we're talking a lot about digital platforms. It doesn't have to be facilitated in, in a digital environment. All of the things that we've been talking about, all of the things that make a difference. And, you know, Ian alluded to this when he said, you can make these changes tomorrow. Most of, the, most of it is really more to do with a, a shift in mindset. And a shift from thinking about this kind of one and done approach where, you know, you set up an event, you send an invitation and you, you kind of hope for the best. Um, it, it, the, just just pr providing um, that, that idea of a continuous journey um, is enough. That, that's what excites the learners. And it doesn't have to be in a digital environment. And, and I'll say something else on this question, too. If you're not in a situation, if you're in a retail situation or a factory situation where you can't really bring people to a classroom, you can really rely on the immediate manager. You can certainly train the manager to provide small sessions in their weekly meetings, or they can just gather people on one corner of the floor. I'm not going to name names here, but there's a pretty famous computer manufacturing store. And every time I go to that store, I see people huddled in the corner, learning directly from their manager in a very short, quick burst of learning. I, I guarantee you that that that'll work when you really engage the learners and the manager's excited about that potential of sharing. Yeah, and th th there's another one here actually about an LMS. So um, the question is about, well, you know, what if I've got existing technology? What if I've got existing platforms? How does how does that work? And I mean, what what I'd say just just from a Hemsley Fraser perspective um, is that that's a that's actually a good thing. Um, so the platforms that I briefly showed you just for a second, um, they actually work best when they're deployed next to um, you know enterprise solutions that already exist, especially LMS. Um, because what, when we created these platforms, what we really wanted to do is focus on the user experience. Um, and that meant both on both sides, so the learner and the learning manager. And what that meant was actually stripping out, very purposely stripping out a lot of the functionality that is otherwise provided by an LMS. Um, and when you do that, when you take away a lot of that, a lot of that heavy, useful reporting functionality that an LMS brings, and, and, and compliance uh, auditing uh, processes and so on, what you're left with is a really user-friendly, highly tactile, highly engaging uh, experience. And when you combine the two, that's when you've got something really powerful. Um, because yes, you, you can certainly adhere to your uh, compliance protocol, but you're also providing a, a, almost like a skin, like a, a surface layer that engages and excites the learners. We've got one more question here and certainly please throw in some others we have a few minutes left but i've got one more question about something that you said or something that we said and the question is you keep referring to the lack of workbooks it looks like you don't hand them out anymore are workbooks just not best practice anymore well um that's a great question i mean actually in our experience and increasingly so no um, quite frankly, they're not best practice. Um, that might sound slightly unusual, and you might say, well, you know, what are you doing instead? Um, but quite frankly, it, it's more, if you're together in a room and you're, the organization has taken the, the time and expense to get 10, 12, 20 people in a room together, what you should be focusing on is the sort of human interaction. You should be focusing on sharing stories, sharing experiences, and learning from each other. The person at the front of the room ought really not to be a trainer. They ought to be a facilitator. They should facilitate discussion. They should facilitate sharing. And you don't need a workbook for that. Um, what, what you need is perhaps a, a quick reference guide that you can take away with you. Um, you might want um, a, perhaps a digitized version of a, of a, of a, a slim down workbook that's got models, things to remember, top tips, do's and don'ts. All of that sort of stuff but we recommend and, and, and frankly practice this idea that workbooks shouldn't be part of an effective training uh, experience and it looks like that's all the questions we got on behalf of both ben myself and everyone at hemsley fraser we'd really like to thank you for joining again if you'd like to learn more about any of the things we talked about or the services we provide our website is listed there right at bottom left on the center of your screen Let's pass it on back to Hester. And Hester, thank you for being such a fantastic host as well. Thanks, all.
I'd like to thank our presenters as well as all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the archive recording will be available on the HR.com website within 24 hours and the webcast credit will show in your HR.com account within two business days. We'll also send you an email with your credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.